him. No, no worries. <laughs> he was sitting over there yesterday, and people, oh, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> Let me give that to you. Great. I think Beautiful. it's actually two stuck together. That's great. Thank you. I don't mind sharing. Such a guy. Yeah. So, Reginald, welcome. Thanks for doing this this morning. Glad to be here, Mike. Now, uh, just for the record, of course, we're going to ask permission to use this as part of the TLS Digital 2018 Anniversary Publication. You have my consent. That's great. So the first question we want to ask you is, how did you come to TLS? What, how, did, how did TLS come to you? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I was made aware of TLS shortly after we had started working on the historic Freedmanstown Labyrinth here in right. Houston. And uh, largely in part to Jay Staley, he had shared with me that there's this organization. I had just gotten, um, gotten my hands, I think, dirty around the idea of building labyrinths and this community of folks who are all into this uh, type of uh, spiritual work. And I started just exploring what the organization was about. And <clears throat> it was around that time that um, I was made aware of the uh, 2015 gathering uh, the 17th annual gathering in uh, Indiana and thought, you know, what better way to learn more than to go in and meet the folks behind the scenes and see how they uh, congregate and, and uh, share information about the labyrinth with the broader community. And so uh, that project was what led me to getting more involved in TLS. Sure. And so um, can you talk just a little more about the Historic Friedman's project you did here in Houston? Sure. So the historic Freedmanstown Labyrinth was uh, my first labyrinth build. Uh, we had walked labyrinths before with students that were involved in the construction and the design of that particular labyrinth. Uh, all of that work took place through an outreach program called the Sacred Sites Quest, SSQ for short, uh, which was birthed out of the Bonniac Institute. On the campus of Rice University here in Houston, there's a nonprofit organization called the Bonniac Institute, uh, founded by a, a doctor named Milton Bonniac. And his desire, uh, due to some tragic experiences he had with one of his children, uh, was to create a space, uh, a thinking space, to allow others who share a passion for diversity, a passion for religious tolerance to bring to Houston um, speakers and symposiums and seminars that would help address um, our, our need for accepting each other on a spiritual level, the, the, despite the differences in denominations. So that was, for the most part, what the Bonniac Institute was all about. So I was appointed to the board of the Bonniac Institute, and right around the time of my appointment, the board was going through a strategic uh, shift in their outreach and one of the tenants that came from that um, reorganization of sorts was a, a hyper focus on youth uh, primarily high school age students and so the board agreed that you know talking to adults is kind of like preaching to the choir when you're dealing with spirituality you're usually going to talk to people who already share your beliefs and so we thought if we we're going to make any kind of real significant change or have an impact in Houston let's reach out to the next generation. And so those students became the target for our work. Uh, right around that time, the Bonnick Institute hired a, a gentleman named Mike Pardee, who was an amazing youth leader. And um, we both shared a lot of passion for working with high school students. So he and I uh, had coffee one day and uh, brainstormed up this idea of this kind of a scavenger hunt of sorts of sacred spaces and We'd have clues and, and tips to, uh, once the kids went to these various locations, which included mosques and temples and synagogues and, um, and labyrinths. And so I had walked labyrinths as part of our journey uh, through visiting these sacred spaces, but my experience was not much deeper than that. But at the culmination of this tour of these sacred spaces across Houston, um, my role was to help facilitate the creation of a public art project that would be a reflection of kind of, of their synthesis of understanding. So whatever the kids gathered from visiting and, and in some cases worshiping with these various denominations and congregations across the city, they would create a public art project that was a reflection of that learning. And for five years, we created murals and some 
art installations around the city. But in our fifth year, we decided uh, through a series of um, fortuitous events to create a labyrinth. And that's where I met uh, Jay Staley, who uh, became our labyrinth coach. And uh, Jay kind of guided us in the understanding of the labyrinth, the, the principles of the labyrinth. Um, I have a high proficiency in just building things, so I was confident that we could build it if I understood it. Uh, I think I share a uh, philosophy of Tom Vetter. If you can draw it on paper, you can draw it on the ground. And um, you know, being an artist, I'm very confident in my drawing abilities. And so we took a design, modified it. It was the, the shark's pattern. And uh, that became the uh, blueprint for the, the Freedmanstown Labyrinth. And so over the course of about 12 weeks, um, we recruited our 30 high school kids. They then attracted about 120 additional volunteers. These are people coming from all over the city. And uh, over the course of those weekends, we moved about 56 tons of uh, sand, um, about 12, to, well, 56 tons of sand, no, 56 tons of granite, 12 tons of sand. We laid down over 2,000 bricks to create this wonderful sacred space in one of Houston's oldest African-American communities. And uh, after that, I absolutely fell in love with labyrinth work. Um, the other part of that experience that really built my interest was watching Jay facilitate the monthly labyrinth walks. Because after the construction of the labyrinth, the whole idea is how do we sustain this? And Jay, with his, uh, with his wisdom, realized that if um, we were to hold public labyrinth walks on a regular basis, it would just build more interest, more awareness. And as I would go out on a, on a monthly basis and witness, sometimes I wouldn't even walk, I would just watch people walk. Time and time again, people would come off the path and testify to the power of what was happening on the labyrinth. And so over the course of my you know, 20 year career as a public artist, I have uh, been very fortunate to get a lot of great recognition and adoration for the work, uh, but quite frankly, no one's ever told me that one of my public art projects had changed their life. And so hearing comments and the feedback from folks month after month, walk after walk, about how that labyrinth touched them on a very spiritual, introspective way, I realized that this type of work was now becoming a part of my portfolio, and I was going to continue learning about the labyrinth and, and now spread that love throughout Houston and around the world. Can you talk, it, it strikes me that your work is particularly intergenerational, intercultural, and collaborations are happening there that wouldn't happen otherwise. Can you talk about that, how, how the outreach from Labyrinth is, is kind of promoting that? Yeah, so, it, so I tell you where it came from. So I look at like patterns, I love patterns, right? I love looking at things and seeing, finding the pattern in them. And I look at my life and I think like, why did you get into this? Like, why do you like working with old folks and you like working with the young folks? Why do you love traveling? And I can, I think for the most part, within all of us, we draw from our youth experiences. The things that we did when we were kids, sometimes we don't realize we bring them into our adulthood lives, good or bad, right? And so I remember my dad always going to the nursing homes. He would always pack up uh, some fruit. First we'd go to the market. This is what, no matter where we live, and we moved a lot uh, due to the nature of my, dad, my dad's job. But we moved a lot, and wherever we go, he would find a nursing home or a senior citizen living facility space, and he would adopt some elders. <clears throat> and throughout my life, me and my brother would always have to go with him, and he would find an old man to shave, and he'd find some ladies to give fruit to. And it, 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 it's what helped me respect that generation. And we would always spend time with my grandparents in the country. Um, usually during the summer, we lived in the city, but they lived in rural Louisiana, and we would spend our summers growing up, you know, um, playing in the woods. And so that also helped reinforce my appreciation for elders. And so, um, so I was dragging that into my adulthood, not even realizing that that was going to be such a, a component of my work. Um, my dad was a soil scientist, and so um, whenever we would go out in nature, he knew all of the plants. He was a botanist, so he knew all the plants, he knew all the trees, and, 
and you knew all the soil types, and it was like being with a magician, right? And I love nature. We lived in environments that were always very outdoorsy. Like I grew up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and Reno, Nevada, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Phoenix, Arizona, and Cheyenne, Wyoming. So these were my stomping grounds. And so hiking canyons and trails and, and spending time out in the outdoors, being with my father gave me a great appreciation for the natural way of things, the natural order of things, and all the systems and patterns that you find in nature. So then that's some more baggage that I brought into my um, adulthood, particularly in my art career. And then when I decided I wanted to live off my creativity uh, about 20 years ago, and was afforded an opportunity to create my first public mural, I was asked to work with a group of kids, very young children. And quite honestly, I wasn't really excited about it because I'd never done it before. I was more interested in just the opportunity that I had to paint and had a big wall and it was a big opportunity to kind of showcase my creative style in a very public forum. But I fell in love with these kids. I fell in love with the, the excitement that they brought into the studio every day and and then the, the ideas that they shared with me that were so far foreign than what I would have come up with. And at the culmination of that project and the time of the dedication where all of these kids, parents and community members and civic leaders are there to, to, to witness the unveiling of this mural, uh, to hear the kids talk about the work and how proud they were of themselves and how they would have never thought they could do something like this, I realized that that was part of my journey. To, to share, inspire, uh, empower children. And so over the course of the last 20 years, I've found ways to bring those things together. Nature, I think the labyrinth was a part of that, working in the environment, um, touching the earth, being connected to the ground, um, children, um, because I love children, and working with elders because of the wisdom that you get when you get older, get into that stage of life. And I, I learned that we all benefit from having relationships with each other. And so my work now is very much about deliberately bringing those worlds together. Mm -hmm. um, you travel, you, you sponsor travel expeditions. Yes. Uh, talk about that. Uh, we traveled a lot growing up. Uh, most of it was intercontinental. Um, my dad loved a good road trip, so during spring break and you know, Christmas break and any time we had a three-day weekend, uh, we would jump on the road and crisscross the country if that's what he wanted to do. So uh, by the time I got to high school, I'd been to just about every state in the continental U.S., uh, with the exception to Canada and Alaska, and so I had a profound love for diversity of space. And uh, we moved a lot growing up, so I fell in love with just different people, different backgrounds, different conversations, different traditions. Um, and again, these are those experiences as a kid that affect the things you do as an adult. So um, when I was given a chance to travel abroad, <coughs> which was, <coughs> we had gone to Mexico, we'd gone up to Canada, uh, but I'd never left, um, never flown overseas. And so right around the time that my wife and I met, um, I was given a chance to, to travel throughout Europe with her and uh, absolutely loved all of that, you know, just seeing a whole nother world, all that you read in books, you see it real time. Um, then we, we traveled to Africa due to a, a nice commission that we had received early in my career. And that just started to affect my desire to wanting to see the world and bring all of that back to Houston. Um, and Houston's a really diverse city, so I could take parts of what I was seeing in these foreign countries and connect with groups here in Houston that could appreciate that I was seeing other parts of the world and bringing a little flavor of their own country back. And I started to weave that into my work. And um, so in 2012, I was given an opportunity to create a sculpture in Lyon, France, and had a wonderful experience working with a children's hospital there and creating this sculpture. And it was at that time that I wrote Mike Pardee a uh, postcard. And I said, Mike, this would be an amazing location for an SSQ. This was April the 11th, um, 2012. And fast forward 
four years later, we did just that. We, we took and leveraged all of that energy of those students who built the Freedman's Town Labyrinth. And through a series of uh, fortuitous events, we found funders, we found partners, and we took 15 high school kids from Houston um, much of that core group of the, the labyrinth, the youth labyrinth builders that were part of Freedman's Town, um, to France, where we basically did an SSQ French style. Uh, we started in France, we went up to Amiens, uh, we visited Chartres, and then our um, culmination, the culminating experience was our five days in Lyon where we constructed a labyrinth at the Basilica de Fauvier, um, just adjacent to the highest, most sacred part of the city. And that was everything to me, to see these kids that had never been out of Houston, had never been on an airplane in some cases, hadn't been away from home, uh, create this family unit and leave a legacy in the form of a labyrinth in such a magnificent place, uh, just affirmed that I was on my path. And so uh, we've since gone to Ecuador, where we built a labyrinth this summer on the equator, uh, and we now have plans to uh, take some of those same kids to South Africa next summer. Um, we have an adult sacred site quest being planned for Ireland in uh, the fall, and then we'll take those same kids to India uh, in December of 2017. And due to TLS uh, being present this year, we've met two individuals who are very interested in us coming to Africa, Rwanda and uh, Kenya respectively in 2018. And so um, we'll continue, you know, sharing these experiences with youth and hopefully create these sacred spaces around the world and uh, let the world see what our young folks are capable of. I think one of the things that um, I, I've been feeling, I think we've all been feeling this week is, uh, in fact, I can't really assign a word to what I'm feeling after election night. Mm. But it strikes me that there's a timeliness to the labyrinth, to the slow meditation, to the the contact with the earth and such. So can you talk about, I mean, I, mean, I think it's one thing for people our age or our generation to, to look at where this may go, where, where it may take us and where, it, but um, our youngsters need, I think at this point, to be equipped with new coping mechanisms. I agree. And I think that the work you're doing and I think the sacred space concept and the inner spirituality that exists and is offered by the labyrinth can provide that to young people. So can you can you talk about that? Well, I, I share that uh, kind of weird, <laughs> don't quite know how to explain it feeling mm -hmm. uh, after um, after the, the wake of this week's events on a political level in, in our country. And I'll tell you, you know, I've learned that in, the universe deals with balance. And so whenever you have a force that is stretching humanity in one direction, uh, the universe has a weird way of stretching us in the opposite direction to balance that out. And so since uh, Thursday, I have fielded more calls from schools and community-based organizations that are interested in our work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been good. I mean, there's like a silver lining in this kind of weird political cloud that is allowing me to do more of what I love to do. And I was having a conversation last night with a really good friend of mine, and he was kind of, you know, he was sharing his thoughts around it. And I was like, man, I, you know, this has been the best week in business for me as a result of this situation, right? And it creates an opportunity for us to um, share with our young people the importance of knowing who they are. Uh, the importance of respecting each other uh, despite our differences. Um, it gives us an opportunity to, to talk to them about all of the things that I witnessed during the last campaign that I felt were dividing people. Uh, it gives us a chance to show the contrast to that, that we're stronger together. Um, our diversity is a, is a benefit, you know, and so the labyrinth work I think has become a perfect tool for us to to reach to, to reach out to these youth in a way that's very counterculture, and at the same time begin to equip them with tools to help them cope with whatever happens in life. Um, because I don't believe that no matter who the president 
or who our elected officials are, at the end of the day, we have a decision on how we want to live our lives. Um, they may influence our lives, but they don't make our lives. And those are kind of messages that this work allows us to convey to these young people is that you're in control of your path, ultimately. And if you understand that and you have tools such as the labyrinth um, to help cope with the stresses and the contrast and the, the kind of things you can't quite understand, um, I think they ultimately will be better off individually. And as they grow into leadership positions themselves, the country will be better off and ultimately our humanity will be better off. Thanks. Jody? Too many things. Uh, one, one thing that I, I remember from um, Indiana, from the TLS meeting in Indiana, when you showed your film about how, you know, the Sacred Sites Quest and building uh, the Freedmen's uh, Labyrinth and so on. And there were two things that struck me about that that I hadn't forgotten. And one was the source of the bricks, which I'd, I'd love to have you address, and how that affected the community in which you essentially replaced the church. And then uh, also the, the fact that you instantly ran out of money just at the moment you were beginning this work with you two. So, um, so when we began the design phase of Freedman's Town, um, we had a commitment from the Bonnick Institute to help make that project materialize. And they had gone through leadership uh, changes. Mike Party had actually left. He went on to, to Atlanta uh, to lead a really dynamic school there. And so a new director came in who didn't necessarily share um, the vision uh, and the commitment to youth. Uh, in fact, they kind of reversed and said, hey, you know, the kids are cool, but we're going to get back to what we're more familiar with and we're going to focus on the adults. <clears throat> and it was right at the time that we were beginning to construct, that we were about to start the construction of the labyrinth. And with the decision, the shift in that decision um, came a they, they basically pull the rug out for the funding that they initially committed to the project. And so <clears throat> here we are in one of our final design sessions, and we're trying to you know, shield the kids from the news because we don't quite know exactly what's gonna happen. And you know, we're trying to wait to the last minute to tell them in case something, in case they change their minds, but they did. And so, um, you know, in having to be very transparent, we're here with all the kids and their families, and we tell them that right now we don't know if we're going to be able to build this labyrinth that you all have designed because of lack of funding. And one of the parents um, asked, like, so how much money do you all need? So what, what are we talking about? And we told him the amount, and he was like, hey, I'll, I'll write you all a check. And it was like, wow, it's like, you know, manna from heaven. And of course, you know, the, the room exploded in, in a, a laughter and applause because we now had hope to fulfill this dream. Uh, this time spent designing this wonderful sacred space here, we have the resources now to make it happen. So we then fast forward and we're working through this budget and, and it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was enough. We knew that if, if we had these resources that we could at least accomplish the design that had been uh, drafted by these students. And so as we're kind of going down the, the itemized list of, of budget needs and we're looking at you know, sand and granite and, and um, all the things that we needed, the bricks were one of our biggest expenses to have to get bricks. And we started calling um, stone yards to see if they were willing to donate bricks and we weren't getting a lot of luck there. And Miss Lou Williams, who is one of the uh, more active community members and members of the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, which is the host of the site. This was their uh, formal, former home. Uh, this, this property was where their church once stood. She says, we have bricks. We have bricks that came from the church when it was demolished um, in 2008. And so over the course of this 12 weeks of recruiting all these volunteers, we had a dedicated team of, uh, of ladies that would come every Saturday and with, with um, hammer and chisel 
clean up all of the old mortar off of these bricks. It ended up being about 1,700 bricks that they had to clean up for us to, to make this path. And so the bricks from the historic church became the bricks that we used for this labyrinth, uh, which saved us a little money. Um, it was a great team building experience for these ladies to come. It was almost like a quilting party of sorts. And uh, and I don't know I don't know why it became a gender thing. None of the guys would do it, and it was seen, it was like manual labor, but it, it was beautiful watching these older ladies and these young girls and these teens all working together to, to clean these bricks up because everybody had a part to play. So fast forward again, the, the labyrinth is complete. We're, we're planning for the dedication. The morning of the dedication, uh, nice, cool um, June morning. We're out, all the families are there and everyone's kind of going through their thank yous and you know accolades of who played a part in making this happen. And Miss Lou is then invited to talk about the, the church and the space that we've created uh, this labyrinth within. And the one part that really touched me was uh, she'd always spoken about rebuilding this church. And it always made me feel uncomfortable hearing her say this because it's, it's in a place that that church would never be rebuilt. Like I understand that just Technically, politically, it would never happen. Like the laws have changed where now you have to build it so much smaller, you have to have a parking lot. But when this church was built a hundred and some years ago, none of that existed. And so to rebuild that church on the same property, it would never happen because they would need more land. But I never told her this, but I just like knew in my mind, I was like, wow, that's kind of a weird hope and how awkward it is to have a hope that'll never materialize. So that was always a kind of a point of um, contention for me, is to hear her talk about the rebuilding of this church. But the day of the dedication, she's talking about the history and how she grew up in this church and got married in the church and baptized in the church. And the whole time, she keeps saying, and we are so glad that we have our church back. We're so glad that our church has been rebuilt. And she was referencing the stones. She was referencing these bricks in the labyrinth as a metaphor for the rebuilding of this church. And there's nothing that has filled my heart more than to know that we, through this kind of weird transition of this material, in her mind's eye, they have their church back. And that was an affirmation of the whole project for us. Because that's what she wanted. She called us saying, can you do something to, to create um, a, a, to help transform this space to pay homage to the history and heritage of our church? And we were able to do that. And those bricks, I think, were a very important part of the rebirth, the rebuilding of a church in a very different way. Thank you. Honor. Yes. Now that, that area reminds me that that uh, section of Houston and then where that church stood, was a traditional African-American community? Was that that land was given to former slaves? Yes, yeah, so back in the early 1830s, uh, when Houston was evolving, kind of shifting up into 1864, five, when uh, freed slaves began migrating from East Texas and Southern Northern Louisiana and Southern Oklahoma um, to Houston, all that was swamp land. It was, it was the, I mean, it's right off of the bayou. And so no one wanted to be in that land. So it was given to these freed slaves like, hey, here, if y'all wanna come here, you wanna come to this place that we're gonna call Houston, go stay over there. And through the you know ingenuity and I think the, the necessity of building community, um, the, the freedmen, and that's why it was called Freedman's Town, uh, basically built their own community up. And um, I think due to segregation, everything was insular, so they had to create their own places of commerce and their own schools. Um, they built a brickyard there where these bricks were actually uh, founded. And so that community has a lot of history, not only for African Americans, but history of the United States. Um, and so that was another, I think, unique characteristic of that community that made that labyrinth uh, very powerful. 
because over the course of the last 24 months since we dedicated that labyrinth in June of 2014, we have been able to attract literally thousands of people to come and walk the labyrinth, uh, learn about the history of Freedman's Town that would otherwise never come over there. And many of these are Houstonians who just would, you know, for whatever reason, have no need to come to this little neighborhood kind of nestled in between uh, our downtown central business district, River Oaks, which is one of the most wealthiest um, communities within the city, the Heights, uh, which is a historic community just north of Freedman's Town and Midtown, which is kind of the urban hipster part of the city. And here now you have this just um, contracting historic African American community right there. And this labyrinth has become a magnet to bring folks from all over the city to this space and now has evolved into an opportunity to turn that community into a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is what's being discussed and researched and sought after as we speak. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's So they gave you the swamp and now it's in the middle of this vital area of Houston. Yes. Yes. I'm being cognizant of time because you're part of the mm -hmm. panel discussion at 10. I think at 10. Well, I have to introduce Jay at 10. At 10.15. 10.15. Okay. So, we should probably. so what I always like to offer is the opportunity to say, oh, this is this is great stuff. This Thanks. is great. But sometimes when we separate, um, we go, oh, man, if I were to just said, or if I were to just said. Oh, yes. So, so let's do that now. Okay. There's anything else? Yes. Yeah, so I think this is to Joey's comments earlier about um, kind of where we are. TLS, and perhaps even where uh, we can be, uh, at least through my own perspective or vantage point. Um, I think the opportunity before us uh, through an organization like TLS is to truly embrace our youth. I think it has to be a very deliberate, strategic priority of the board, of the membership, to reach out to our youth. Because if organizations like TLS are to continue to grow and sustain, there has to be the next generation of youth leaders that come to embrace that work. And they're not gonna come to us. They're not gonna come to a conference with a bunch of folks who are like their grandparents. It's not gonna happen. They're not gonna feel as comfortable around people who don't necessarily reflect their own cultural interests. And so I think the kind of work that we're doing in Houston, the kind of work that Lars is doing in California, the kind of work that's happening back on the East Coast with Lisa Moriarty, um, getting into the public schools, getting into community centers, um, working in non-traditional environments with unique audiences, I think has to become a priority um, if we are going to see this work continue to grow and prosper. And so that would be my hopes. Um, that's part of what we hope to continue bringing to the TLS community. And as far as the future, uh, I think we all have a responsibility to get out of our comfort zones and share the power of the past, the power of the labyrinth with audiences that don't necessarily look or think like us uh, if we're gonna see this continue to grow, so. Fabulous. Wonderful. Is your I guess I could call it, this, we don't have to record this, it's more of a personal.